Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I have finished the repairs and restorations on my SB600 speaker and power supply and on the HW101 transceiver and they both turned out great. Let's check them out. If you've been keeping up with this series, you'll definitely remember the starting condition of these case halves. The paint was in terrible shape and was flaking off in large areas. It definitely needed to be removed down to bare aluminum and I had two chemical paint strippers in mind, one of which was more user friendly than the other. Here's the two chemicals that I tried for removing the paint from this HW101 and did not get into any particular brand here. I'm not plugging or recommending either one of these. I'm just telling you the facts of what worked for me. And the short story is they both work. Um, the one on the right, I applied to the zone right here and it took it down to bare metal after about 24 hours covered in plastic. Uh, the one on the left did the same thing in a test area here and here. The smaller area I did not cover with plastic because it said that you don't really need to because it doesn't evaporate as fast. Uh, the one on the left I would say is the least scary without getting into you know the actual chemicals and the hazards that are there because some of them are quite uh, risky depending on what chemicals are in there. So that one I'd say is the least scary. The one on the right I'd say is medium. It's got some uh, protection that is required when you're applying it, but it's not as scary as some of the other ones that have been out there. And again, I'm not going to get into the chemistry. You can study that for yourself and make your own judgment about what level of aggressiveness and associated hazard you would need. But the good thing is it seems to work. The, I should say the, the least scary one seems to work fine. So that's what I'll be trying. And then lastly, there are two layers of paint on here. I may not come through in the camera, but I'll try to do a zoom in shot and, and show you on the areas where I did remove it. There's definitely two shades of green there. So somebody has repainted this in the past. And the part of the case on the left, even though it looks like I went at it with the stripper, I did not. That's just the shape that it's in. The paint is coming off already. It's just flaking off. So um, hopefully I won't have a hard time getting these down uh, to completely bare metal and get them ready for primer. Okay, with that decision made, it's time to get busy with it. The stripper has the consistency of mayonnaise, so it is really easy to apply exactly where you want it, and it does stay in place. And it does indeed have a pleasant citrus smell. Still, I'm doing this step with all the windows open. Now, even though it says it does not need to be wrapped in plastic, I'm doing it anyway because the air is very dry this time of year, and I want to give the stripper the maximum chance to work. I let it set for 24 hours. On the spot test that I did, it removed all the paint after setting for that long. And it did just as well on the full size piece. Look at how well it softened the paint. A lot of it is stuck to the plastic. I'm using a plastic scraper instead of a metal one so I don't scratch the aluminum. And look, even a blunt tool like this is taking almost all the paint residue off. The chemicals in the stripper also reawoke the smoke stench in the paint and man, this doesn't smell like citrus anymore. But the upside is, the bare aluminum certainly won't retain that odor, so it'll be gone forever from these parts. There are some areas of the original color coat that may look like they haven't been touched, but in reality, all the paint, including this lower layer, has been softened. That layer is very sticky and not coming off easily with the scraper. So after shooting this, I took it over to the utility tub and I was able to easily remove the remaining residue with a mild scotch bright pad and some warm water. Here's what it looked like afterward. Nice! The paint is almost entirely gone. There are some small areas that the stripper didn't completely remove, but overall it did a fantastic job. I tried using a razor blade to scrape those areas, but that was a bad idea. The razor started digging into the aluminum. So I decided to do a second application and that removed it. And no, I did not strip the inside of the case. That just wasn't worth the effort. Alright, time to repeat the process for the top half of the case. I follow the same steps, apply the goo, wrap it in plastic, and let it set for a day. Most of the paint came off, but there were some larger areas than on the lower case half that didn't budge. But no worries, they budged after our second application. Now there were some really small areas on the vents that still remained, but a bit of sanding took care of them.
I thought about sanding the entire surfaces of all the parts before applying the primer, but I didn't do it. And my thought process was Heathkit didn't do it back in the day, and their factory paints generally hold up well over the decades. What I did do is use a self-etching primer as my base coat after I wiped the surfaces down with acetone to remove any surface oils. Now these self-etching primers contain a mild acid which helps break through surface oxides and are specifically recommended to be used with aluminum. Now, even though I'm showing all one particular brand of paint here, I'm not plugging or rec recommending a particular brand. This is just, just what I happened to choose for this project. After a few light coats of the primer, I applied one coat of this texture paint. Now, that step made me the most nervous because I wasn't sure how it would turn out. And as it turns out, this stuff is very hard to control. I had a couple spots where it built up thicker than I wanted. And it goes fast. This single can was barely enough for three pieces I needed to paint. Next comes the color coats. The specific shade of green that I chose is called moss green, and I bought it in a satin finish. Now, I thought that color went well with the other colors on the front panel and with the knob colors. And then lastly, I put on three top coats of a matte clear coat. Now this finish is probably not absolutely necessary since the paint already has the right sheen, but I'm thinking the clear coat at a minimum will add a little more wear resistance and some protection. I did not shoot any footage of the painting steps. It's just too much work to set up a camera in an area where you're doing spray painting. And let's face it, it's kind of boring anyway and there's plenty of videos on YouTube showing folks painting stuff. So let's just cut to the finish and take a look at how they turned out. And here's how the top and bottom cases turned out. I think the finish looks really good. In fact, it kind of exceeds my expectations considering my skill level and the fact that I used off-the-shelf paints. And I do really like this texture. It definitely breaks up the monotony of the large flat surfaces and it does help hide small defects. Now there is a very subtle stripe effect on the main surface of both pieces. Apparently I did not get the color coats to perfectly overlap, but you really have to look for it in just the right lighting to see it. But I can live with that. It was not my intent to make this rig a museum piece. I just want it to look good sitting with all my other gear. With the HW101 case halves now looking sharp, I moved on to the speaker case. Remember this footage? This is what the SB600 looked like after multiple cleanings. The paint was permanently stained, so it definitely needed attention. I waffled for a while about whether to sand it down and feather the flaked off areas or just to strip it all off. In the end, I decided to remove it, mostly because I noticed I could get more areas of paint to chip off pretty easily. So on with the stripper. Now initially it looked like a winner, the paint was coming off in large chunks. But I greatly underestimated just how difficult this was going to be. Think about it, this case is essentially a giant strainer. There must be more than 10,000 of these tiny holes, and each and every one of them has paint on the inside surface. I ended up using two coats of the stripper, outside and inside the case, and a lot of scrubbing in the utility tub. And even so, I scrubbed it again when it was dry because there was paint still flaking out of those holes. But eventually no more paint came out, and it was ready for primer. Man, what a job. So here's what it looks like after all the painting steps. Now for sure, this is definitely not a match to the original color. The factory Heathkit green on the SB600 and other items from that era was much lighter, almost a mint green. I chose to paint it the same color because this guy is the companion for the HW101. It can't work without it. And since they'll likely be sitting right next to each other in my shack, it's good to have them match each other. Oop, can't forget about the speaker grill. For some odd reason, it had a black stripe down the center. I could not find any pictures online that showed a factory unit with that stripe, so I'm assuming it was repainted that way. Well, whether the paint was factory original or not, the stripper didn't care. It took it right off. The grill looks like it's made from zinc plated steel. It's definitely not aluminum. But nonetheless, I followed the same paint steps, minus the texture, and I used a satin sheen black paint instead of green. And it also turned out great. I even wire brushed the heads of the four speaker mounting screws and gave them a blast of the same primer and black paint. 
At this point, I'm sure some of you are thinking, why didn't he just repaint these in the original Heathkit colors? Well, here's why. Between them both, there could be up to three different shades of green to consider. There's a shade for the HW101 case, there's a lighter shade for the SB600 case, and there's a shade of green for the SB600 grill, which might have been the same green as the HW101 case, but I wasn't able to completely verify that doing my uh, research online. But what I did find online is a lot of folks tended to believe that these shades kind of drifted over time, which meant that Heathkit may not have even use the same Pantone color formula or whatever it was consistently throughout the production runs. But let's just assume that there were three different shades of green to deal with here. The big issue, of course, is there are no off-the-shelf paint colors that match any of those Heathkit greens. Now, it is possible to get custom colors blended, of course, and my research did turn up a few folks who claim to have found some color combos that matched pretty closely to some of those Heath kit greens. So at least it seemed feasible that you could get custom paint blended to match the historical colors. Once you have the colors established, the next problem to solve is, of course, applying them. Now, you can get some outfits to custom blend small batches and put them in spray cans for you, but obviously the most common route is to buy pints or quarts and use a conventional air sprayer and apply it that way. I don't have that equipment. I have no plans to ever buy that equipment, which means if I was not going to go the spray can route, I'd have to find somebody to do the painting for me. So the real issue I'm tap dancing around here is basically cost. The best pricing I could see online for getting custom color spray cans was about 50 bucks a piece. So let's say it's $150 for three different colors. That's just not worth it to me. Now, if these two had some real sentimental value or historical value and they really needed a factory style color restoration, then maybe. But in my case, not going to spend that kind of money on this. I'd rather spend the money on something else. One last item before I can start reassembly. This wooden speaker support, it is really decrepit. I mean, it's just crumbling to pieces. Ideally, I'd use a piece of three quarter MDF, but I didn't have any and I was not in the mood to drop 20 bucks on a small section at the hardware store. What I did have though is this scrap piece of three quarter inch plywood, so I used it instead. Fabbing a new one is easy enough. I just used the old one as a template to trace the outline onto the plywood, then cut it out with the saber saw. Here's the cut piece that fits right into the case. And here it is after a coat of black latex paint. Easy peasy plywood squeezy, or something like that. The stock attachment is dubious. There's only these two little tabs at the top of the opening to receive mounting screws. That leaves the bottom flopping around loose. So what I did was use slightly longer screws on the mounting feet that thread into the plywood. Now it's securely locked in place. Yeah, the mounting feet are tan. They were missing when I got the unit, so I had to buy new ones and that's all they had at the hardware store. The next little headache is the speaker cloth. This is the original. I did wash it out though to get rid of the smoke residue. It does not want to stay in place during assembly. But no problem, I used a few dabs of Mod Podge to tack it in place, and after that dried, it wasn't moving around anymore. After that comes the speaker grill. It's actually a bit too big, and it did scratch off the paint in a few areas, so I had to touch those up. Next comes the Heathkit badge. Hey, put it on right side up, dummy. It's held on with a pair of clips. Next, the speaker goes in, and it fastens to the wooden speaker support using four bolts, the ones that I painted earlier. After that comes the beefy power supply. There's four bolts that secure it to the case. And after that, I attach the two back feet and it is done. I'm happy with how it turned out. In fact, the only thing that I could point out that is a bit disappointing is, on the left side of the case, there is some blotchiness where I didn't get the paint uniformly into all of the holes. But that's only visible at a precise lighting angle and you can't see it from the front. Before I can put the case halves back on the 101, these annoying Tinnerman clips need to be reinstalled on the bottom case. They sure do a nice job of scratching off the paint. After that, the chassis gets sandwiched between the top and bottom case, and there's over a dozen machine screws and sheet metal screws to install to lock it all together. Can't forget the feet. These four are the original black ones that came with the unit when I bought it. And that's it. It's all back together. Gotta give it the customary ride on the turntable. I'm really happy with this project. For sure, I did catch some good luck with this bad boy. 
Considering the shape it was in when I bought it, it could have had a host of other problems that might have been fatal. And just as a refresher, here's what it looked like riding the same turntable shortly after I got it home. Yuck! I was hoping that I'd found a diamond in the rough, and if you recall I budgeted around $200 for the repairs and restorations. Tallying up what I spent, I did come in a bit over at around $240 to cover both, but no complaints. I'm happy with the money and the time that I've spent on rescuing this rig. Now this would all be for naught if it couldn't make contacts. So before I close, I gotta show a little footage of the first QSO that I made with it. And more great luck. After only 30 seconds of calling CQ on 40 meters, I got a reply from a fellow ham who also has an HW101 in his collection. I did make a rookie mistake and I initially had the mic gain set too high, but after some back and forth guidance, I got it dialed in. Let's listen in now to that QSO. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. This is KA9NNR uh, 73s. Yeah, is that November, November radio, right? Roger, Roger. Kilo Alpha 9, November, November radio. All right. Well, sounds good. I'll look you up on uh, QRZ. Yeah, I got uh, some pictures of my uh, HW101 on my uh, QRZ page, too. So, all right. Well, sounds good. What's the name there? Uh, name here is Darren. Go ahead. Okay, Darren. Very good. Yeah, my name is Ken. 73, and good luck with the uh, with the old Heath kit. Thanks very much, Ken, and happy holidays. So that's it for these two. I'm very happy to add them to my ever-growing collection of ham radio gear. I'm looking forward to using these on the air more and more, especially in some boat anchor uh, contests that come up every now and then during the year, or maybe just one weekend when I want to get them out and just have some old-time fun. As always, thanks very much for watching this series. I do hope you enjoyed it and enjoyed me attempting to save these items from a landfill and not being used anymore. So until next time, bye for now.